What's going on, everybody? My name is Adele, sports neurologist at the UCLA Brain Sport Program. I've got a really awesome guest today, Aaliyah Snyder, sports neuropsychologist, formerly at UCLA Brain Sport. Now somewhere in Florida, I think maybe I'm university. I'm still a researcher there, though. Still, I'm still, yeah, I'm you're still, still, yeah, still, you're still hot, you guys. Us, yeah, um, and also the first Israeli women's skeleton athlete, right? Nice Olympic job. athlete. Yeah, you, you, uh, yeah. Olympic really wannabe. Out. So Olympic hopeful. Olympic hopeful, mm-hmm. right? But mm-hmm. nonetheless, you're here to talk to us about skeleton. So can can you just give us an intro on like what skeleton, like what is skeleton? I know it's a Winter Olympic game. Yeah. Um, I know I think the more popular sort of Winter Olympic game in that sort of realm is the bobsledding, right? Yeah, most people know bobsled, but there's there's three different sports that take place on that same kind of ice track that bobsled uses. So there's bobsled, which, you know, there's an actual sled and people are in. Then there's luge and skeleton. Luge people are more familiar with. That's the one where you go feet first. Right. And then skeleton is the other one, and that's where you go head first. So is that the only one that you actually go head first? Uh, yes, right. And right. it was, uh, you know, it's an old sport. It came around about the same time as bobsled, and it was in the early uh, Olympic Games in the 1900s. Uh, but I think that they they took it out of the, the Olympic Games for a good chunk of time and brought it back in 2002. Do you know why? Was there a specific reason they took it out? Uh, you know, I'm not so sure on the history, but I think from what I remember is that it's like, uh, kind of dangerous. <laughs> yeah, people it, are like, like, it takes a special kind of person, right? Because you're <laughs> going... It, on the bob side, you're going like 60 miles an hour. Is that right? You're going a little slower? Uh, no, they're going... They're pretty fast. It depends on the track. Right. But like... At luge is the fastest sport, and then, but like with skeleton, you you're hitting in the 70, right. 70 miles an hour. So it's like y'all are really special people, right? Because the bobsledders were like, all right, it's going to be all three of us facing forward, sitting down, kind of safe. But then someone gets the bright idea: I'm going by myself, and I'm going head first at about 60 to what's the fastest anyone's ever gone on the? Uh... I don't know. I think like the Whistler track was one of the fastest, and I. I, I think it was up near eighty, but eighty miles an hour. Yeah, I never, I never slid on Whistler. But but, but people have gone that fast. I think so. That's yeah. typical. It's pretty fast. Head, well, like mid seventies is like upper range is where you may hit. Yeah, head, head first. Crap. <laughs> that seems to be the part Unreal. that most people. That, that seems so dangerous, but so fun at the same time. It's all relative, I think. You know, to me, doing aerials, like skiing aerials, right. is way more dangerous than right. you know. I am connected to the sled. I. I it, are you strapped, yeah. are you actually strapped down to this? No, that was no, that right? was not right. <laughs> okay, so yeah. I'm like lying on top of the sled, but it just if like the way that that sport and control comes across, I, uh, yeah, no, it's. Do you have Do you have any idea like as a as like a sports neurologist? I'm like, oh my gosh, can't, I can't believe people do this. But as like a human being that uh-huh. like likes adventure that sounds amazing yeah you know, i can see why people do it and then the fact that you could represent your country doing that mm-hmm. something like that's fun that sounds absolutely amazing so um why is it such a big deal why do why do i care about people doing this from a sports neurologist perspective well i think it gives some really interesting insights into concussion and brain injury that you don't get from other sports mm-hmm. so uh, with football, we're getting some information, but there's so many outside factors, including like pain, opioid use, substances, all these things that kind of can cloud the the data. Not that there's not that in skeleton, but there's also a different mechanism that's coming across. And I think the mechanism in skeleton is not like these overt huge hits where you can look at them and be like, oh my God, that person was like laid out, uh, although that happens. It's that the the process of skeleton itself, each run, there's a lot of like intense vibrations. It's like a little bit too soft a word, right. but there's a lot of pressure on the body and the head is very close to the ice. Right. And so you're, you're in some, in, in some cases, you're kind of hitting your head against the ice, especially around the big turns where you can pull up to five G's and um, it creates a lot of pressure around the, the neck, around the head. And so five G's, five G's going around uh, the turn, the big turns, in the big yeah. turns, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so you were pulling five G's, you would up, say up to that, like you're not doing that the whole time, right? But, there's right, but there are in multiple in instances where you're pulling five G's, where your neck has to sustain five mm-hmm. G's of force on your head. Yeah, depending Depending on how many runs you take, right? And to um, give a little context <laughs> yeah, to, the, to, to that to those G's, um, what do you happen to know? 
how many G's it takes um, an astronaut blasting off into space Funny, by any Daniel, chance? Funny, Daniel, I do know <laughs> it is three G's. Three G's, yeah. so less. Less, less. Okay. So and, that, but that's sustained G force right, as well. Still, yeah, right? Like what other, what other sport are you, you know, uh, ha- having that many G's that's um, unique. multiple times, mm-hmm. right? It's very unique. So. Right, definitely. And it's so, in- I mean, we can, we can talk about it later, but it's so interesting, right? Like, um, so what you're saying is there's, there's not a direct impact, right? It's not like these, these people doing this, they're getting into accidents, right? Where they're out, where they get knocked out. It's just having to sustain those G's, mm-hmm. right? And you said that in that sport, your head hangs over the sled, right? Right. It's not stabilized on the sled. Right. The so sled it's not comes, like you're just like mm-hmm. laying there, right? Like, it you comes know, snoozing up and then just sliding down, right? right? Like there's a lot that goes into it, especially sustaining your head. Mm-hmm. Because your head is not supported by the sled, it's just hanging over the side. Yeah, yeah. And right. there's, you know, there are, there are definitely crashes. Right. Um, but especially with, you know, the, the higher level, they're called sliders, uh, you know, they get to know a, a track really well. And so the chances that they're going to actually have a catastrophic crash go down dramatically. Right. You know, the more experience you have on a track, the better you are. Right. But they're still withstanding all that, uh, the, the forces of the track. And we have right. a couple of videos that kind of show right. how chaotic that, that is. And a lot of the injuries that I sustained and the reason we're talking about this is because I my career was cut off because I was having such a hard time recovering from concussions. Right. And it got to the point where I just like was constantly symptomatic and doctors told me like you gotta stop. Right. So let's see what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Let's see let's see some of these videos. So this is give us some context. Tell us what this video is. Well, let's see. Uh this is the greatest hits video. So you'll see kind of what it looks like when people I mess up and hit walls. Um, you know, a lot of like beginner sliders definitely experience this. But the, but these aren't crashes, right? Not necessarily. These aren't crashes. These are just kind of the same thing that you're talking about. That your head has to sustain these mm-hmm. sort of aggressive sort of hits on the wall, right? Mm-hmm. Being yeah. thrust back into the other wall. Yeah. All right, let's see it. Yeah, so like you have Sheesh. messy entrances, you're just kind of being ping ponging around. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. Uh, and like I said, I'm I'm really just focused on the head from from like a concussion standpoint, right? Mm-hmm. And as you've talked about, you don't have to be hit in the head to have concussive impacts. Right. Oh. Yeah, that's a good. Point. That's a good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I mean, I think that provides us some context, right? Yeah. The second video shows like what a more typical run looks like, but right. you still see kind of the the rotating and you right. see the speed. It really illustrates what it's like. And this is a point of view, yes. right? So, so this, this is, is as if you're the you're the person mm-hmm. um, heading down head first like a lunatic at 60 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Lake Placid track. Right. This is the one that uh, I trained on most of the time. Right. And and this track is notorious for being. It's one of the t- the trickier, more technical tracks. Okay. Yeah. So you know you're starting to ramp up speed. All right. How fast do you think you're going right now? Do you say? I think that one's like forty five. Forty five. This is a section called the Devil's Highway. Dude. Yeah, and it's that's what it sounds like oh my when you're doing it. We're about to come up on one of the the big turns right here. You pull a lot of G's around that turn. A lot of accidents around here. And then you start to, this is where my last concussion actually was. And then we're getting to the end of the track, last turn, then it starts to go uphill in a second. Oh my gosh, dude. So it's about a mile. It's about a mile of that. That's intense. Yeah. That's so intense. Yeah, I'm not doing it now. <laughs> <laughs> what, is it fun? I said, blast. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I used to tell people when they ask me, like, why are you doing that? It's like, it, you feel like you're flying. Right. It's the closest I think you can get to flying on your own. Right. But then when you have a bad run, it's like a minute of a car crash. Right. So, uh, w- was yeah. that a clean run? Yeah, yeah. By that guy? Mm-hmm, that was a clean that one. W- that wasn't you? 
Just for the record. <laughs> no, no, that, that was not, not me. <laughs> that was a guy. But that was a relatively clean run. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you still saw how, you know, your head, your neck has to sustain your head mm-hmm. in the same place, right? Yeah. It's not like a smooth experience, right, even right. when you it's have a beautiful like, run. Right. It's not a water slide, yeah, right, yeah. where it's fun and then you crash into the pool at the end and so <laughs> on and so forth. What's coming out more recently is that... Uh, and, and the reason I left the sport, but it's getting a lot more attention, especially in the last three, four or five years, is the kind of cumulative impact of being on the track. And that's starting to um, have some athletes coming out and talking about longer term effects that they're experiencing. And for me personally, like that's why I left. And it took me a long time to recover. And there's some, you know, arguing about what that recovery really looked like. Right. So that's kind of, it's a good place to think about, well, what are some of these subconcussive impacts doing? Um, What types of different lenses can we look at them through and to understand concussion and a larger picture and recovery? How'd you get involved first off? Because it's a really weird sport to just like pick up, right? I was, I was coaching, I was coaching rowing in Connecticut and I was living up that way. And uh, I had a friend um, who was on the bobsled team. And so I would go out to Lake Placid and just was enamored with it. I I like to surf. I always liked roller coasters. And he made the offhand comment that, hey, you might be good at this. So that was all I needed to kind of go. And he he could tell me how to get involved. So I started at one of the the training camps. And... um, I really loved it. I mean, you get beat to hell, right. but it was a week. And and towards the end of that week, I, I got a pretty serious concussion by the end. Did you? But it wasn't obvious. You know, it wasn't like I had one of these big crashes, any kind of emergency or catastrophic event. So after your first run, did you feel any symptoms or anything like that? No. Or? No. no. It, it was, was a cumulative mm-hmm. run after run. And that week, how many were you doing a run a day or what What would that look like? I, you know, I, I don't remember exactly, but it was like... I think one to th- maybe up to three runs okay. a day. Yeah. You know, they started off as uh, easy, and they started off, you know, further down the track. So we weren't hitting seventy miles an okay. hour at like our first time, but yeah. we did go off the top and hit uh, some higher speeds. So you know, there were two of us who ended up with concussions towards the end, but they didn't really. I wouldn't. I only label it as concussion because I understand it was now. At the time, I was told it was a trauma headache. A and, trauma headache? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is at the Olympic Center, right? right. Uh, and, you know, I know better now. There's no such thing as a just a trauma headache. Right, and, you know, right. after you have something like this, it's yeah. called a concussion. What were some symptoms that you had at the end? Um, I was feeling really foggy. Right. You know, I was just starting to kind of go in and out of interacting with people. Yeah. I was starting to feel like just off balance and and just very foggy is how it started. Yeah. And definitely headachey. Right. Um, and I felt nauseous, but I wasn't vomiting. And it just kind of got worse over time. I ended up taking, I think, one less run the last day, but it got it got pretty bad. My symptoms evolved over the next two to three days. Right. And I drove myself back from Lake Placid to Connecticut. And I have very little memory of doing of, that. Of driving back. Yeah. I went to a, like a grocery store and got extremely overwhelmed. I just started crying in the grocery store because uh-huh. I didn't know how to get myself food. I came out with like Mountain Dew, which I hate Mountain Dew, right. like a mushroom soup and like Sour Patch Kids. I just like couldn't organize myself right. in the grocery store to make decisions. Now I got to ask, is that is that something that you had experienced like earlier in life with, Never. you know, like anxiety or any sort of overstimulation, like panic disorder or anything like that? No, no. So that was just like, what the hell yeah. just happened? Yeah, I was right? like, like that just never happened to me. I was, and I wasn't that aware that it was that off. I just, I felt something that was off, but right. I didn't know why. Right, right. And I wasn't really like putting it all together. Yeah. Um, and then I, I drove out to Connecticut where we were doing a race mm-hmm. and I like fell asleep underneath the boats. Like my the kids I was coaching had to like come find me. Yeah. I gave what they said was like one of the most ridiculous pre-race speeches they'd ever heard that made zero sense. Oh but to God. me, I was like, it's fine. Right. Right. Um, and then it took about a month to recover. Right. And it got pretty bad. Right. Um, and that's basically your first experience with the sport. That's right. Like, this is like, you did a week of it. Yeah. And you came back and you had those symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. And, and no, and then I did. Then I went back. And you yeah, went back. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. And I was like, "Great, great sound. I love it." Right. I mean that. I mean that's a testament to probably how much fun it is. So then I guess you know you start competing. Um, right? Yeah. So then I came back the next season because that was towards the end, and uh, went to some more training camps. Started training in Lake Placid in Park City, mm-hmm. and definitely like never really got back to where I had felt before the first concussion. Really? Yeah. So I started having a lot of trouble exercising. So Mm -hmm. even though I was training in like a massive amount, Mm -hmm. um, I gained like 20 pounds in muscle mass over the summer. I was Mm -hmm. like really fit. I was having a lot of headaches when I was exercising. Okay. A lot of pain. And you never had headaches before? No. Well, I'm not like, not like that. Not like I would sprint and just immediately have headaches or be training through this. And I just assumed because I had stepped up my level of athletic training that this was normal. And it wasn't until like years, like like a year later, I was like, everybody gets headaches when they're like weightlifting and training. And everybody's like, no, (laughs) no, (laughs) don't. Um, So uh, yeah, I came back and, you know, kept training. I, and I'd have these spots throughout the year where it would like become too much. My headaches would get really intense. I'd start to do this zoning in, zoning out. And uh, again, never any overt crash, but these experiences that kept happening, I got better at knowing, okay, I need to sit out the next day. Mm -hmm. But I never really took a lot of time off because you're you're only on track for so much amount of time. Then you're back home training and Mm -hmm. then back on track. Mm -hmm. Um, So... There was a lot of times I was just sliding through low-level, at the time, concussive symptoms, which then became much more problematic later. So this is like um, over how many years? So over two years. My career, most people come to the sport late. Pretty short-lived. Yeah. 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 Do you find that that's the case with a lot of people? I don't know. It's a pretty self-selecting sport. So like out of the tryout class that I was in. I think only maybe one or two people actually like pursued it afterwards. Right, right, right. So a lot of people will will self select out. Okay. Um, and it was also normalized, you know, that right. everybody is concussed on the track. Right. At they some a term degree. For it, you said, right? Sledhead. Sledhead. Yeah. So um, explain that. So it was just something you you have this constellation of symptoms after your run Mm -hmm. oh you just got some sled head you'll get over it. right kind of like light sensitivity sound sensitivity feeling a little off a little headachey and pain i think it's different for different people but there's this kind of like cluster of symptoms that uh you know overlap with like migraine and concussion but you just start to experience them on and off the track as well and you found that everyone around you was sort of experiencing these things after no no No? not really like nobody would talk about it um people after i left the sport people would like message me who knew that i left the sport because of this and be like hey i'm having these symptoms too like what do you think but it wasn't talked about among like teammates and coaches that open but it must have been common enough to get to get, to get yeah. a, a sort of a term assigned to it, yeah, right? I think now. So like they didn't have the sled head term when I was sliding, oh, or at really? least I didn't hear it. You know, they might have had it in the last five years because I, I stopped sliding like many years ago, right. and uh, you know, more recently, it's it seems to be part of the sport lexicon. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, now enough people and come to turn, you know, come to find out that a lot of the Canadians women's team were struggling with similar symptoms uh-huh. and, um, you know, have yeah. you found that just, I guess, anecdotally, I don't know if they've done any studies on it, but have you found that, um, more women are having these symptoms than men or is it uh, anecdotally, the ones I, th- I think that have come forward about these symptoms have mostly been women. Right. Um, but there's, there is zero research. Right, right. I've, yeah, I, yeah I, I did the uh, presentation for our group and tried to like do a deep dive, and right. there's like it's tough. one paper right. that, and it's it's like a maybe how many injuries there are. It's right. not even a, an exploration of what people are experiencing. Because uh, theoretically, it would make sense, right? Um, that women would probably w- might have more symptoms than that because mm-hmm. neck strength, neck strength, yeah, exactly. So neck strength is. Um, really important for for i think preventing concussions because it stabilizes the head Mm -hmm, right and we talk about that in football right where you're dealing with direct impacts yeah yeah. but i think it's probably more so important in this sport in this sledding sport where that's really it right Mm -hmm. like you're hinging around right exactly you just have to stabilize your head yeah right so it would it would theoretically make sense for you know women but 
<sighs> concussion is uh, oh, yeah. complicated, <laughs> very yeah, complicated. So, so within the first week of doing it, you're having these symptoms. Did you find that? So that, that was the first week and you weren't even going all the way to the top, getting up to like 70, 80 the miles an hour. The first week we did go to the top. You I did. don't think I, I don't know if I hit over 70 that first week because you're like slow on your pushing right, and right. like real clunky down the track. Yeah, so yeah. it's a hard learning curve right. skeleton because you're, you're really messy and hitting a lot. We have guys who come out with just like massive bruising all the way down their arms. Yeah, from slamming and, into the wall. Yeah, black eyes, even with helmets oh on. Oh my gosh. You know, like yeah. I've got some wild pictures I'll have to show you yeah, at some definitely. point. Yeah. So did you find that you were having these symptoms easier? Like in, yes, in the yes. fact that like, Okay, maybe you had to do three runs to feel these symptoms where, mm -hmm. you know, the more you did it, the farther along you got into your two-year career. Yeah. Now it would only take one run. Yeah, it was like the smaller hits would do it. Like the fastest, best run of my entire brief career uh, was my last. Mm -hmm. And I barely registered the fact that I had bumped my chin, bumped, it, it was a little harder than a bump. But, right. you know, coming out of uh, one of those turns, I, you know, hit my chin on the on the on the ice and that was it that was it like, that's all it took yeah i came out and i was feeling weird and then it just kept getting worse right and then i was you know in a place where i could barely get out of bed because i was so symptomatic right and you know it just and it didn't go away right and uh and so that was the time that i i think i had seen a doctor prior to that but i went and saw her again and um, she had experience in this and gave me the recommendation that she wasn't going to clear me. You should then, stop. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a big, uh, that's a big thing when we were thinking about retiring. So we don't, we don't like retire people, right? Where yeah. we like pull them out. We right. always work with the athlete and see what they want and work with them. Right. But, mm -hmm. uh, generally, um, a decreased threshold for having a concussion is one of the main, uh, one yeah. of the primary, um, things that we use to help retire someone or to yeah. suggest retirement for someone. And that's right? exactly what she said to me. It was right. like, you know, it's taking less and less. Uh, my worry for you is that if you keep going, you're right. just going to spend a lot of time concussed. And it was starting to impact my performance. So right. after that last concussion, I went to the push track the next day, which is not on the ice. It's right. where you practice your pushing. You're pushing right. And I was just like tripping over myself. And my down times, my push times were starting to get slower overall. And I was fitter and more like right. should have been getting better, Didn't but like sense. the coordination was starting to slip. Yeah. And, you know, even after that last concussion, I was like, maybe I can still come back to this and was still really struggling with that. And, Sheesh. you know, that was when it was like, oh, well, I just can't push quickly enough. Right. I don't have any chances of actually competing in the, in the upper, upper echelons right. because like, my, my coordination is off. Right. So how are you doing now? I mean, now, now I'm doing well, right. but there's, you know, it's interesting. It's taken me this many years of being a PhD in this field right. to understand why I've probably struggled so much. And there's these ideas um, about why people may have persistent symptoms that we're starting to understand about the autonomic nervous <coughs> system yeah. and how concussion and injuries, and I think skeleton in particular, which yields you really vulnerable to um, problems with the nervous system because your stress response is controlled in many parts by your brain, right. most part by your brain. Right. And it's vulnerable to getting dysregulated mm -hmm. when you have these injuries. And if you keep having those injuries, it keeps becoming dysregulated. And then that's tied into everything. That's right. tied into so many systems, right. digestion, cognition, everything. So, you know, there's some ideas out there that maybe some of these persistent symptoms are less related to explicit structural brain damage, mm -hmm. the functional dysregulation of the nervous system that then gets, you know, perpetuated either by avoiding activities, right. by anxiety that right. it creates. Yeah. 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 So I just had a I just had a patient uh, <coughs> today um, that he had a he had a concussion um, snowboarding like, you know, several months ago mm -hmm. and um he didn't really he wasn't really getting any answers right as mm -hmm. to what was going on why was he still having symptoms and a lot of it was relating to the sort of anxiety right that mm -hmm. regarding why am i still having symptoms right that was kind of serving as a positive feedback loop and perpetuating the symptoms further right right because um, like a concrete example of that is okay so you have an injury and your the the whole control network of your brain is dysregulated from the injury, right. and 
let's say, you know, your heart rate starts to become really variable because that is in part regulated by your, like that's regulated by your brain. Everything is regulated. Everything by is your brain. regulated by your brain. Right. So your heart rate starts to become, uh, you know, a little bit erratic, or you know, we call this heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. um, so your heart is affected, or your heart rate, the control of that is affected, and when your heart rate becomes disorganized or is is affected, your brain then uses its monitoring of your heart rate to. It raises like the temperature on anxiety. The autonomic, right, the, yeah, right, it raises. Right. It makes it harder to think. Your like memory starts to go because right. it's a feedback loop. Right. If your heart is dysregulated, your brain is responding with a stress loop cycle. Right. And then it's you know it's not because people are just just anxious. Right, right, you know, right. it's not some personality flaw, which is I think when people hear that diagnosis or hear that suggestion after injury is a really hard thing to reconcile. They're like, no, I, this is a real thing that I'm going through. I'm right. not just anxious, right. Right. but like it, both are true right. is that the dysregulation of the nervous system and how your body is responding to stress is a problem and that any type of stress, right. hearing your name called out is a form of stress, yeah. you know? So um, I'm wondering, you know, we know that people with anxiety and with other comorbidities like migraine, they're predisposed to having this complicated concussion mm -hmm, disease mm -hmm. course, right? Secondary to what it sounds like you're saying is is um, sort of this exaggerated response to um, that the brain has in a positive feedback loop between reading what the heart is doing and that causing the brain to basically misinterpret that, right? And then dumping mm -hmm. sort of the sympathetic dump that caught, that uh, sort of potentiates the mm -hmm. anxiety. Yeah, or overreacts right. to the stimuli. Right. Now, yeah. do you think that there's like a predisposition um, for that with uh, folks that have anxiety already? Or Yeah, I mean, we know that people who have anxiety, migraine, um, you know, orthostatic issues have autonomic dysfunction to begin with, or, you know, it's a spectrum. It might not be a yes or no. It's that they tend to have more dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. So then you add an injury on top of that, right. you know, of course, you know, if the water's already kind of high, you dump a rainstorm on it, it's going to flood the banks. Right, right, right. Uh, and maybe that rainstorm doesn't have to be as much for one person as the other. Yeah. So there are a lot of underlying conditions like migraine and anxiety that uh, may contribute to something, just kind of how your body handles uh, stress and how susceptible it is to dysregulation from the injury, which is going to happen right. to anybody. Because there's studies out there where they've done uh, functional MRIs and they've, in anxiety-related disorders, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. PTSD, for example, is like an anxiety-related disorder. Right. And they've noted some sort of dysfunction in the the limbic nervous system, right? Which mm -hmm. is very intertwined with that sort of stress response that you're talking about. Absolutely. And, yeah. and then they also have noticed that that a similar dysfunction in more severe TBI, mm -hmm. right? Certainly. I don't think that they've identified it yet with just concussions, having a, a, a that sort of dysfunction or any sort of... Uh, you know, people are starting to look at the, yeah. the HPA axis and yeah. have looked at some functional differences there, which people are, you know, ask the question, is this damage? Is this compensation? Right. Is this functional? Right. It's not that simple. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there is... Definitely indication of autonomic dysfunction after after um, injury, both in the acute time frame, and now we're seeing with people who have persistent symptoms. Right. And then, and then, if you treat the autonomic dysfunction, people get better. Mm. And it's really one of the only targets that people are trying are seeing that you know if we do this, the persistent symptoms go away because there's not a good medication you can throw at it. You know this. Uh, there's not a good yeah. medication you can throw at it. Um, you know. And how do you treat autonomic dysfunction? It's like a systems treatment. Right. It's through exercise. It's through therapy. Uh, there's some medications that can certainly help, right. but it's not like there's a medication you can give in the chronic period of concussion that just fixes reverses it. all the symptoms, right? right. right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>